Well, now, in the course of time, in the evolution of Western thought, the ceramic image of the world ran into trouble and changed into what I call the fully automatic model or image of the world. In other words, Western science was based on the idea that there are laws of nature. And it got that idea from Judaism and Christianity and Islam. That, in other words, the potter, the maker of the world, in the beginning of things, laid down the laws. And the, the law of God, which is also the law of nature, is called the Logos. And uh, in Christianity, the Logos is the second person of the Trinity, incarnate as Jesus Christ, who thereby is the perfect exemplar of the divine law. So we have tended to think of all natural phenomena as responding to laws, as if, in other words, the laws of the world were like the rails on which a streetcar or a tram or a train runs. And these things exist in a certain way, and all events respond to these laws. You know that limerick, there was a young man who said, Damn, for it certainly seems that I am a creature that moves in determinate grooves. I'm not even a bus, I'm a tram. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's this idea that there's a kind of a plan. And everything responds and obeys that plan. Well, in the 18th century, Western intellectuals began to suspect this idea. And what they suspected is whether there is a lawmaker, whether there is an architect of the universe. And they found out, or they reasoned, that you don't have to suppose that there is. Why? Because the hypothesis of God does not help us to make any predictions. In other words, let's put it this way. If the business of science is to make predictions about what's going to happen, science is essentially prophecy. What's going to happen? By studying the behavior of the past and describing it carefully, we can make predictions about what's going to happen in the future. That's really the whole of science. And to do this, and to make successful predictions, you do not need God as a hypothesis, because it makes no difference to anything. If you say everything is controlled by God, everything is governed by God, that doesn't make any difference to your prediction of what's going to happen. And so what they did was simply drop that hypothesis. But they kept the hypothesis of law. Because if you can predict, if you can study the past and describe how things have behaved, and you've got some regularities in the behavior of the universe, you call that law. Although it may not be law in the ordinary sense of the word, it's simply regularity. And so they, what they did was they got rid of the lawmaker and kept the law. And so they conceived the universe in terms of a mechanism. Something, in other words, that is functioning according to regular clock-like mechanical principles. Newton's whole image of the world is based on billiards. The atoms are billiard balls and they bang each other around. And so your behavior, you, every, every individual therefore is defined as a very, very complex arrangement of billiard balls being banged around by everything else. And so behind the fully automatic model of the universe is the notion that reality itself is, to use the favorite term of 19th century scientists, blind energy. In, say, the metaphysics of Ernst Haeckel, and T.H. Huxley, the world is basically nothing but blind, unintelligent force. And likewise, in parallel to this, in the philosophy of Freud, the basic psychological energy is libido, which is blind lust. 
And it is only a fluke, it is only as a result of uh, pure chances that resulting from the exuberance of this energy, there are people with values, with reason, with languages, with cultures, and with love. Just a fluke. Like, you know, 1,000 monkeys typing 1,000 typewriters for a million years will eventually type the Encyclopedia Britannica. And of course, the moment they stop typing the Encyclopedia Britannica, they will relapse into nonsense. And so in order that that shall not happen, because you and I are flukes in this cosmos, and we like our way of life, we like being human, if we want to keep it, say these people, we've got to fight nature because it'll turn us back into nonsense the moment we let it. And so we've got to impose our will upon this world as if we were something completely alien to it from outside. And so we get a culture based on the idea of the war between man and nature. And we talk about the conquest of space the conquest of Everest and the great symbols of our culture are the rocket and the bulldozer. The rocket, you know, compensation for the sexually inadequate male. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to conquer space. You know, we're in space already, way out. If anybody cared to be sensitive, and let what's outside space come to you. You can, if your eyes are clear enough. Aided by telescopes, aided by uh, radio astronomy, aided by all the kind of sensitive instruments we can devise. We are as far out in space as we're ever going to get. But, uh, you know, sensitivity isn't the pitch. In, in the, especially in the WASP culture of the United States, we define manliness in terms of aggression, you see, because we are not, we're a little bit frightened as to whether we are really men. And so we put on this great show of being a tough guy. Uh, it's completely unnecessary. Uh, it, it, you know, if you have what it takes, you don't need to put on that show. You don't need to beat nature into submission. Why be hostile to nature? Because after all, you are a symptom of nature you as a human being, you grow out of this physical universe in just exactly the same way that an apple grows off an apple tree. So let's say the tree which grows apples is a tree which apples, using apple as a verb. And a world in which human beings arrive is a world that peoples. And so the existence of people is symptomatic of the kind of universe we live in. Just as spots on somebody's skin are symptomatic of chickenpox. But we have been brought up by reason of our two great myths, the ceramic and the fully automatic, not to feel that we belong in the world. So our popular speech reflects it. We say, I came into this world. You didn't, you came out of it. We say, face facts. We talk about encounters with reality, as if it was a head-on meeting of completely alien agencies, and the average person has the sensation that he is a somewhat that exists inside a bag of skin, a center of consciousness, which looks out at this thing and what the hell is it going to do to me, you see? Uh, I recognize you, you kind of look like me, and uh, I've seen myself in a mirror, and uh, y you look like you might be people. <laughs> So maybe you're intelligent, maybe you can love too. And uh, may, perhaps you're all right, some of you are anyway. If you, you've got the right color of skin or you have the right religion or whatever it is, you're okay. But there are all those people over in Asia, Africa, and they may not really be people. When you want to destroy someone, you always define them as unpeople, not really human. Monkeys may be, idiots may be, machines may be, but not people. But we have this hostility to the external world because of the superstition, the myth, 
the absolutely unfounded theory that you yourself exist only inside your skin. Now, I want to propose another idea altogether. And other astronomers either say there was a primordial explosion, an enormous bang millions of years ago, billions of years ago, which flung all the galaxies into space. Well, let's take that just for the sake of argument and say that was the way it happened. It's like uh, you took a bottle of ink and you threw it at a wall. <laughs> Smash, and all that ink spreads. Zish. And in the middle, it's dense, isn't it? And as it gets out on the edge, the little droplets are finer and finer and make more complicated patterns. See? So in the same way, there was a big bang in the beginning of things and it spread. And you and I, sitting here in this room, as complicated human beings, are way, way out on the fringe of that bang. We are the complicated little patterns on the end of it. Very interesting. But so we define ourselves as being only that. If you think that you are only inside your skin, you define yourself as one very complicated little curly cue, way out on the edge of that explosion, way out in space and way out in time. Billions of years ago, you were a big bang. But now you're a complicated human being. And we, then we cut ourselves off <coughs> like this and don't feel that we are still the big bang. But you are. Depends how you define yourself. You are actually, if, if this is the way things started, if there was a big bang in the beginning, you're not something that is a result of the Big Bang on the end of the process. You are still the process. You are the Big Bang, the original force of the universe coming on as whoever you are. See, when I meet you, I see not just what you define yourself as, Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. I see every one of you as the primordial energy of the universe coming on at me in this particular way. I know I'm that too. But we've learned to define ourselves as separate from it. And so what I would call a kind of a basic problem we've got to go through first is to understand that there are no such things as things. That is to say separate things or separate events. That that is only a way of talking. And if you can understand this, you're going to have no further problems. <laughs> I once asked a group of high school children, what do you mean by a thing? And first of all, they gave me all sorts of synonyms. They said, it's an object, which is simply another word for a thing. It doesn't tell you anything about what you mean by a thing. And finally, a very smart girl from Italy who was in the group said, a thing is a noun. And she was quite right. A noun isn't a part of nature, it's a part of speech. There are no nouns in the physical world. There are no separate things in the physical world either. See, the physical world is wiggly. The clouds, mountains, trees, people are all wiggly. And uh, only when human beings get working at things, they <coughs> build buildings in straight lines and try and make out that the world isn't really wiggly. But here are we sitting in this room all built on straight lines, but each one of us is as wiggly as all get out. <laughs> now then, when you uh, want to get control of something that wiggles, it's pretty difficult, isn't it? You try and pick up a fish in your hands and the fish is wiggly and it slips out. What do you do to get hold of a fish? You use a net. And so the, the net is the basic thing we have for getting hold of the wiggly world. And so if you want to get hold of this wiggle, you've got to put a net over it. And I can number the holes in a net. So many so holes up, so many holes across. And if I can number these holes, I can count exactly where each wiggle is in terms of a hole in that net. And that's the beginning of calculus the art of measuring the world. But in order to do that, I've got to break up the wiggle into bits 
I've got to call this a specific bit, and this the next bit of the wiggle, and this the next bit, and this the next bit of the wiggle. And so these bits are things or events. Bits of wiggles, which I mark out in order to talk about the wiggle, in order to measure it, and therefore in order to control it. But in nature, in fact, in the physical world, the wiggle isn't bitted. Like you don't get a cut up fryer out of an egg. <laughs> but you have to cut the chicken up in order to eat it. You bite it. But it doesn't come bitten. So the world doesn't come thing. It doesn't come evented. You and I are all as much continuous with the physical universe as a wave is continuous with the ocean. The ocean waves and the universe peoples. And as the wave, I wave at you and say, you, the world is waving at me with you and saying, uh, hi, I'm here. But we, our consciousness, are the way we feel and sense our existence, being based on a myth that we are made, that we are parts, that we are things, our consciousness has been influenced so that each one of us does not feel that. We feel we have been hypnotized, literally hypnotized, by social convention into feeling and sensing that we exist only inside our skins. That we are not the original bang, but just something out on the end of it. And therefore we are scared stiff. Because my wave is going to disappear. And I'm going to die. And that would be awful. We've got a mythology going now, which as uh, Father Maskell put it, we are nothing but something that happens between the maternity ward and the crematorium. <laughs> and that's it. And therefore, everybody feels unhappy and miserable. You know, this is what people really believe. You may go to church, you may say you believe in this, that, and the other, but you don't. Even Jehovah's Witnesses, who are the most fundamentalist fundamentalists, they are polite when they come round and knock at the door. But if you really believed in Christianity, you'd be screaming in the streets. But nobody does. You'd be taking full-page ads in the paper every day. You'd have the most terrifying television programs. The churches would be going out of their minds if they really believe what they teach. But they don't. They think they ought to believe what they teach. They believe they should believe, but they don't believe it. Because what we really believe is the fully automatic model. And that is our basic, plausible common sense.